Um, thank you, everybody. So, yeah, again, welcome to everybody that is um, attending today. Thank you for sharing your Friday time to hear um, this very interesting um, project projects result. My name is Lucia Xtakui. I work at Wikirate as a, a community and data manager. And with me is my colleague, uh, Tom Howey, who is uh, our communications manager. And he's going to also be um, helping us to present some of the yeah, may, most relevant information about Wikirate and this particular project. Uh, so today is an special event in which we will um, pretty much center in sharing the results of uh, a project that was um, designed by Chris Adams, director from the Greenway Foundation, and that he, um, well, we, he, He's been a, a, a long time contact and partner and supporter of the Wikirate um, organization. And yeah, he's going to tell us all about like, why did he want to use Wikirate to collect data, how the process uh, went, and most, most importantly, what are the main trends, um, the main analysis points that he, um, yeah, he made after collecting the data. So our agenda is going to be very simple. We are on time for the welcome. Uh, we're going to jump right away, right, right away, um, and and give the microphone to Chris to hear uh, about his project. How much of the internet is covered by credible? This is very important, credible net zero targets. Um, and then we are going to have uh, 15 minutes for q and I'm sure you, you will have some questions. Then I am going to present uh, an overview of how we set projects on Wikirate and um, how you could get involved. And I'm going to make a couple of invitations and announcements for our next um, research adventures, I would say. So without further ado, please, um, Chris, do you want me to share do you, your other uh, presentation? Oh, I can share my screen. Shall oh, I you do can. that? Yeah, yes. that might be a bit easier for me to Let's do it. share the view that way. And that way yes. um, saves the whole thing where you know you have someone asking like, next slide, please, next slide, please. Like that. <laughs> yes. Okay. So with Thanks. that in mind, what I'm going to ask then, oh, I'll try sharing my screen. I just need to check if I'm a host, so I'm able to. Yes, I, it looks like I can. So if you can see this screen, please do just nod or make some kind of movement. Okay, excellent. We have some thumbs up, which it seems like makes me think I can proceed. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you to thank you for giving me your time on a Friday afternoon. As you'd imagine, and as Lucia outlined, one of the works that we're doing uh, was to find out which tech firms actually have uh, net zero targets that you might want to believe. Uh, just some context. I work at a nonprofit based in the Netherlands called the Greenway Foundation. We have a mission of basically working towards a fossil free internet by 2030. And we use open source and open data and things like this to increase uh, the reach that we have, because otherwise we're a relatively small organization based in Taiwan, Germany, the UK, and we found open is a quite useful way for us to have conversations that we otherwise would not be able to have with people. Uh, this is what I'm going to cover in the time I have with your attention. I'll provide a bit of context about the technology sector and the ICT sector and uh, essentially what kind of we should be doing. I'll talk a little bit about how we use Wikirate and why we use Wikirate. Then I'll share a bit of time for some of the findings uh, to provide some context for the questions that we actually have. So first of all, the ICT sector level response to the climate crisis. Now, before I go any further, I realize that not everyone might be familiar with the term ICT. It stands for Information and Communication Technology. You might think of it as just like tech firms, essentially, is another way to think about it. And the thing that it's useful to bear in mind is that this quote here that I'm sharing with you, uh, if we want to stay on track for 1.5 degrees of warming, which is generally considered the least worst option we have in terms of climate and climate change right now, we need to see a halving of emissions by about 45% by 2030. This isn't me saying this. This is the International Standards Body called the ITU, who published a press release about this in 2020, saying this is what we're going to do. And this we've done the number crunching and this is what we have. This is what we're aiming for. And the nice thing is 
They even have these cool kind of reassuring charts for the direction society might need to be going in. And you can see that in, say, 2020, that's where they kind of start in the middle. And then you would expect things to be reducing year on year to get to like half by the end of this decade. Now, one thing we saw recently is that the kind of mission changed somewhat. So rather than being about reduced emissions by uh, 45%, there's been a whole kind of rewording to start talking about helping everyone else re achieve mission reductions. And this, I can see why you might say this, but this also does seem like it's moving uh, the focus away from uh, one, one large and fast growing tech sector when we need to bear in mind that every, every single sector has to halve emissions and get down to zero if we want to basically avoid the worst of the climate change, uh, the worst of climate change that we are facing and experiencing the news on a daily on a daily basis now. So for context, I we've done some previous research in this field already. So we did a report in 2021 where I'm going to share some diagrams from this to just give some more uh, uh, so, so some more useful information. And there's also a magazine that we published called Branch. Uh, which dives into this intersection between technology and climate in a lot more detail and from lots of other perspectives. And when we talk about technology and the tech sector, you might think of there being various kinds of impacts that are created by our use of digital, digital technology. So this thing here, this diagram here is from our report, and it basically shows you might have like three main areas that people think about when they talk about the direct impacts of technology. So you have data centers, which are those giant buildings that are full of computers that you may be aware of. Networks, that's like towers and cables and things like that. And there's the devices that we all hold and use that you're presumably using uh, to experience uh, this video uh, we have right now. And there are various forms of impact which go beyond greenhouse gas emissions. So that's one thing we talk about a lot, but there are also issues like water or say, abiotic resource consumption, which is essentially things being drawn out of the soil that we may want to use in future and so on. There are all these very dis different ways of talking about environmental impacts of technology. And most of the time, when technology firms talk about this, they tend to focus on these parts here. So you can see there's a huge part of the, the discussion which is kind of left out. And this is what we, re we actually delved into for our report. But we know that carbon emissions are a key thing. And one thing we found was that if we're going to be talking about the role that very, very large technology firms play in our life, we need to have access to the information so we can have a data informed conversation for groups like civil society and lawmakers to be part of this. So we can actually hit the kind of global targets that we do have and ideally see less of the kind of climate induced fires and disasters and strife that we see in the news all the time now. And one thing we talk about is in that report is this idea that we need to actually have a degree of open data and transparency inside this so that we can actually have this kind of informed basis. And this is kind of how we talk about this. And this is one problem we see right now in discussions is that right now, if you're gonna have a conversation about the environmental impact of technology, you might have some open data, but that open data is not always up to date with what's happening in the real world. And uh, a lot of large firms tend to rely on private proprietary, proprietary data, which they use to basically make an argument to say, oh, we don't need to be making changes or we should be allowed to keep going as we are without, without anyone really kind of talking to us about what kind of impacts we are causing along the way. And this is one thing we were ended up referring to. And it's worth bearing in mind that when you talk about technology, there's different ways of actually running a kind of running, say, cloud services or Internet services or things like this. And if you look back at history, you can see lots and lots of parallels between how we consume cloud services and digital services now and how they're paid for. And also how people rolled out things like electrification uh, globally 100 years ago. There are two different ways of running providing electricity for people in the, in the world. There was one option, which was to have large centralized generation of power in uh, away from say cities, which would basically, where you would essentially get as many people as possible to use as much power as possible. And you essentially made a power plant pay for itself through economies of scale. 
And the other approach was to have much more distributed, localized power generation, which was much more efficient and much more flexible, but didn't, uh, but, and in the end, we had these two options and we ended up using the first option to basically drive kind of the last hundred years of society. And we see a similar thing with technology now where you see very, very large data centers being deployed all around the world. And the only way they could possibly be made, get people to make, make their money back is by getting us to use all, as many digital services as possible to make the numbers kind of pencil out. And this is actually something that we should talk about or, or be aware of, because when we talk about technology, you've got to ask, are we optimizing for this first idea where would you trying to make something which might only work if everyone's using as many digital services as possible, such that large organizations can make uh, can, can make money back on these investments? Or should we be thinking about the kind of very real limits that we're working inside? And do we actually have the data available to have an informed discussion about some of this? So this was the kind of background for what we wanted to talk about here, because we found as an organization working in this space, we found it very difficult for us to essentially have a conversation with either policymakers or even large companies to say, well, which one, which companies should you be working with who are doing the right thing? Which which companies should you not be doing so much work with who, who clearly aren't really prioritizing any of this? And uh, we ended up working with WikiRate to see which technology firms have net zero targets that are credible or not credible. And for context, a net zero target is essentially a target that a company will make that sometime in the future, they will say they have reduced their emissions so much that they only have a residual amount of unavoidable emissions that they will then be able to essentially do uh, take various measures to erase those or remove using various kinds of services or tools to do that. And you might think of a net zero target that looks bad as looking like this, where you keep growing year on year, like we do now, and just put everything off, kind of like not doing your homework until the night before an exam. The problem with this is that there's this whole area under the under the kind of graph that you can see here of basically carbon emissions over time. This means that loads of damage is done all the way up to 2050, for example. And we end up relying on huge amounts of carbon removal, uh, which basically is a massive drag on society, a big cost on society. It's much better to have a target that looks a bit like this. So we act quickly, we leave less carbon in the sky. And you can think of the kind of area under this line as the amount of damage and harm that ends up being done. And also, this also uh, outlines that you probably don't need to have quite so much carbon removal in uh, for this. And when I talk about carbon removal, people talk about things like, say, uh, some kind of new technology, or it might just be planting trees. And if you have a huge amount of carbon to remove, that has significant implications on how you might use the land that we currently use for growing, uh, for growing food or living on and so on and things like that. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the approach we did and what we tried to measure and how we tried to measure this. But I know not, I know that not everyone on this call will be a sustainability expert or even know much about carbon emissions. But generally speaking, when companies talk about their carbon footprint, they talk about a carbon footprint in terms of scoped emissions and three kinds of scopes, which you might think of as scope one, scope two, and scope three. Scope one is basically fossil fuel, is, is carbon emissions from you burning fossil fuels. And uh, the way I, I try to explain it to people is to use something that we're used to on an everyday basis, drinking a cup of coffee. If you think of scope one emissions, that might be you burning gas to heat up a kettle to make coffee. So that's like your scope one. Scope two would be you plugging a kettle into a wall, someone else burning fossil fuels to generate electricity, and then you using it. And scope three would be like all the emissions in a supply chain. So if you walked into a coffee shop and you bought a cup of coffee, there's a bunch of people doing a bunch of stuff such so that you can have coffee. And that's not you burning things directly, but there is still an impact. And this kind of scope one, two, and three, which is basically, you can think of scope one and two as operational emissions, and then scope three is your value chain, your supply chain. You need to think about all three of these if you want to actually have a credible target. Now, you don't need to just listen to me. This is based on figures from uh, the New Climate Institute's reporting on this. And uh, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I won't dive too deeply into the details on this, but essentially we were following their guidance when we were trying to find these numbers for 
uh, various companies. And uh, we used Wikirate to create a research project like you see here, which outlines which companies we could find. We found the top 20 companies by internet usage. And then uh, we ended up running a spreadsheet uh, internally to kind of track this stuff uh, with volunteers to essentially keep track of what we were doing over the summer. And uh, we ended up with a small but dedicated team to actually get the information needed for the top 20 companies. So here's a, if I could put, if I, if, if I knew how to put emojis into this, into this, I would. So I want to just have a quick thank you to Aurelian, uh, Clara, Sue, and Lucia for putting, for, for putting the time in to actually get these together. And I'll now show you a little bit what we found. Oh, I'm doing, okay, oh, I'm a, a, yeah, that's, that's from someone else actually, okay. So the thing we found, first of all, is that we were expecting uh, to find some signs of companies here. We basically didn't find any firms with figures saying they would try and get down to zero emissions uh, for 2025 or 2030. Now, this is a bit depressing, but I guess the good news is we did find one firm with some public forward looking targets. Oh, so this is not great, but it's gives you at least gives you an idea. I think there's someone who might be speaking on the far or on this or might be on mute. If you can go on to mute, I'd be very grateful because it's a little bit distracting as I run through this. Okay. Uh, and uh, what we did find, and uh, if you're curious, um, I'll share the link to this deck, which is online. You can follow the links directly to the charts on which you rate, which show the charts, the, 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 the research that we did, plus the links to this. And if you have any questions from this, you can look precisely at the actual data points that we used to create this. So you can see, you can either arrive at conclusions we found or ideally help provide some corrections and updates for when we do this for next year, for example. So basically the high level thing was of all the stuff, we found one company with a somewhat credible net target, net zero target, and that was for just scope one and two when most of the time companies get most of their carbon emissions from scope three. Now, one thing that we learned along the way is that it's really, really hard to do this right now because every single company has slightly different ways of talking about scope one, two, and three emissions, like that diagram I shared with you. But the good news is, is that we are now seeing some changes in the law coming, which changes in the law coming in 2024, which may help in Europe, we have the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which was passed in September. And in America, or in California, which is the largest economy by a good, good, good way in America, they now have the Climate Corporate Data Accountability Act. These all make it illegal to not report scope one, two, and three emissions uh, if you're above a certain size now. And this would be really interesting to help inform the conversations we need to have. The other thing I will share with you is that you may feel and be somewhat depressed by the findings that we saw that only one out of 20 companies had shared any kind of public targets for where they're going with this. It may be the case that some of these companies do have some credible targets, but they do not share them publicly. These are ideally shared, these are currently shared with companies and organizations like the Science Based Targets Institute. So they might be validated by another organization but they're not in the public domain. And that makes it much harder for us to have a data-informed conversation about the role of large technology firms in our society. So that's the thing I'll share with you if you're feeling totally depressed about this kind of news. Um, finally, is it unreasonable to ask for this? Well, we've now seen the law is really, really clear about this, but BP, an oil company, published this as, publishes this stuff on a regular basis. And this is a screenshot of their own report talking about their own targets looking forward for 2025 and 2030. So these are not unreasonable things to be asking for. And the thing you might ask yourself is in future, when you see a technology firm talking about sustainability, ask yourself, are they passing the BP test? Can, can they share this information? Because right now, BP, the oil firm who basically popularized the term carbon footprint, is more transparent than all the technology firms talk on climate right now. And this is something that we think needs to change that we did not expect to see. Finally, as a result of some of this work, we are now doing a bit of policy uh, advice for both the German government as part of the UN Environment Programme, uh, because essentially this is information which is somewhat, it's people who have a vague understanding of this, but some of this work makes it really, really clear and harder to actually avoid now. So this is some of the stuff we'll be doing in 2024. And uh, you can absolutely stay tuned to find out about some of that. Um, I'll skip the rest of this stuff about where we plan to use this or start surfacing this because I'm running a bit over. But 
hopefully this should this should this should have been somewhat info information informative for you. If you are curious about this work, uh, please do go to the website that you see here. There's a blog post where we detail all this stuff in, well, provide much more detail. And uh, that's my email address. And uh, the link climateaction.tech is the online community I'm part of, where I was working with Lucia and various other people when getting some of this done over the summer. So thank you, folks. And I'll hand back to um, uh, Lucia and Tom now. Okay, cheers. Uh, the last bit of the presentation, I just really wanted to thank you, uh, everybody that participated in this um, project and data collection, also everybody that is here today. And I wanted to give an overview of the project, the data collection project um, that, um, yeah, that we set together with Chris and the Greenway Foundation. So, uh, there are mainly these three, these six, uh, sorry, six stages. The first one is an individual uh, who is passionate about sustainability brings up um, a project idea, a data collection project idea. Um, he or she has clear, clear uh, ideas about which metrics and which companies to research. And together with Wikirate, we set this project. Uh, we organize an open uh, call for participation for volunteers who wants to collect the data, get involved, but more than collecting the data, it's also about learning and connecting with each other. And we provide uh, a training on how to use the platform, which is not so hard once you start. Um, and then, of course, we set some, some deadlines, uh, some soft deadlines, and then a hard deadline. And contributors get to... Um, yeah, look into companies, uh, websites, and reports, looking for these uh, answers that we want to, to find. And they contribute as much as they can, right? If you have only one hour, two hours per week, that's totally fine. Along the way, Wikirate and the project organizer supports, um, support the volunteers or the contributors with any questions, method methodology questions, um, or te technical questions about Wikirate. And then at the end, once the data is collected, what we have is an open data set that um, is available for anyone to, to look into, and to analyze and draw on conclusions. In this case, um, Chris already yeah, has taken um, yeah, a quality assurance process and had, has um, drawn his own conclusions. But as he said, like the data set is there for anybody to, you know, challenge those conclusions, maybe take a second look or have ideas on how to build, build up on this um, information. So thank you again to the invitations and announcements, which is the last slide. Um, the first invitation is to browse projects and join the Wikirate um, community. Browse projects means like we, we as an organization, we organize um, on a regular basis different um, projects like this one, like the, the one that Chris just present. And we're always looking for um, contributors, people that want to uh, participate in these crowdsource um, exercises and learn along the way. Uh, so we have here links to to those pages and want to join as a volunteer. I think, Tom, if you could share the slides on the chat, please, so that everybody can have access to these links. Yeah, um, and I'll send this out afterwards to everyone who attended. Yes, thank you so much. And then we also invite you to contact us if you have a research project idea. So to, if you want to set a data collection project similar to the one that um, Chris just presented. Um, and finally, we are hosting a series of data access webinars when we, where, where we will be showing um, the audience how to access the data, Wikirate data. Um, we have two coming up, one on the 27th and one on the 29th. Those are very close in time because we, yeah, we are um, yeah, just making sure that people on different time zones can have the access to these um, trainings. So feel free to sign up for those or to ask for um, for yeah this information, um, and I think that's it. I, think. Uh, I mean, I would I would yes. just really emphasize that we are open for um, new project ideas um, yeah. for for research. Um, similar it doesn't have to be. Um, 
about CO2 emissions. It can be about any sustainability any sustainability data. Um, so maybe someone on, on the call is running a project and is in, is in need of some open data. Um, or conversely, perhaps someone is uh, um, really super enthusiastic like Sue uh, was. Um, um, I think she enjoyed the experience. Um, she did write a little, give us a little review or said it was easy to find most of the information that, that I imagined it would be. Um, primarily because the framework was in place. Um, if I'd been looking for this information on my own, I don't think I would have got as far as we did together. So I think that's the two parts of what's being, uh, what we're inviting here is like, if you have a project, um, you know, please, we'd love to hear from you and see if we can uh, get that set up on Wikirate for you. And if you're enthusiastic to gain some new research skills and, and, and get involved, then we also uh, warmly uh, welcome, welcome you to, and you can dip your toe into the the Wikirate um, research experience um, at these um, access access webinars. Um, but maybe if anyone else has uh, any other um, questions or thoughts or comments, or if somebody wants to also invite or announce anything, mm -hmm. uh, Chris, I don't know if you have. Something yeah, going on with the yes. Yeah, the thing I was going to share is, share is that it might not be obvious to people who don't use Wikirate that the kind of data set or that group of the existing companies that we created to the top twenty kind of companies making up internet usage, you can use that as a filter for any of the other hundreds upon hundreds of metrics inside Wikirate. So then maybe there's a chance to find some new findings that we haven't actually thought about, but where you might be interested in that collection of companies, or if you might want to grow that company from the top 20 to the top 50, that might include new interesting companies where some of this conversation might be taking place about. So there's there, this is one of the nice things about something being an old linked wiki-like platform. That was the only thing I just shared because that's that, I didn't realize that until halfway through the project. I was like, oh, wow, this is so cool. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was uh, very clear um, way to yeah to share the potential of the the platform actually and and the collaborative work of all of the community members. Um, yes. So I think if nobody else wants to share something else, we can start uh, heading to our weekends. <laughs> um, yeah. Somebody at the audience.